Welcome to the OpenBSD installer talk. So, question up front, who has done an OpenBSD installation? All right, almost everyone. Anyone familiar with this question and answering this question with a yes? Raise your hand. Yes. They're probably familiar with the reinforcement that says, you know, I really want the login name, not the yes and no that you used to. Um, that's an important point about the, the muscle memory. I'll come back later to this. Um, first of all, a little introduction. This is me. I'm Clement. I have been hacking on and playing around with OpenBC for a few years since I was in uni. And most of the stuff I do for fun. And well, I, if I can, I don't, I don't like leaving bugs behind. So I, I try to fix them or uh, at least contribute some uh, quality of life improvements for the project. That's what I do. That's also mostly what I brought me to this talk or to the, to the effort that led up to, led up to this. Um, overview in the beginning of the talk, what you guys will be hearing from me. It's, it's going to be a talk, a um, mixture of a recap for me, what I did, what I learned about the mistakes I made and the things I learned that you don't get from the manual pages because it's too well hidden or there is no manual page for it. And I'll explain the, the high level bits of the installer, how it works, what you can do with it, what you can't do with it, um, why it's hopefully known uh, as one of the nicer things of the open BC, of, of the OpenBC project. And I'll go into detail of how you can get your feet wet and start hacking or maybe fix this bug or this not perfect default you've been seeing so far. And yeah, so I'll show you how it's done, how, what, it, what it takes for the OpenBC installer to, to work the way it does and a few important change, or interesting changes, stuff I did and with that, the lessons I learned and hopefully so that you don't make the same mistakes again. The design goals of the open of, of the OpenBSD installer is is pretty easy. Yeah? We should come up with a very good first impression because it's the very first thing you as a new user get to know of the OpenBSD. So if that breaks, you're very unlikely to install the system and go ahead. Right? But if it shines and if it just works and that's that's the goal really, then you're more likely to stick to it. And it should always be very easy. Shouldn't matter whether you do a network install, a disk install, whether it's on Spark 64 or your AMD 64 laptop. It should always work the same. And it should be minimal effort for you to do the second installation, whether it's an automated in one or a new one. So in a nutshell, it should be as simple as possible. And that's exactly where the problem lies. Uh, it's it's quite hard to do that sometimes. Um, yes. So when I when I talk about the installer, um, I often mean different different things or more of a group of different components. So what the installer does, first of all, it installs, but it can also upgrade. So if you have um, a running OpenBSD installation, you want to get to the new version. The code that does the upgrade is the exact same code that does the installation for you. So when I say install, it really is um, a word for, for, all, for all this, for all the different modes. Um, and hopefully, most of the time, you just hit enter, enter, enter. It's a bit of a boring process, but it should be as boring as possible. So you don't have to think. You don't have to choose between options that are not really options. And it should just pick the same defaults for you and, and work in all the cases. And most of the time, you can also say, if you, if you if you, if you check back and you, you reconsider things, I, I don't want to con configure this disk or I have, to, I have to go back. Most of the time you can also say abort or done and go back, but it's not always the case. And how it works is, or the, the different, different ways of installing is you can, you can do a network installation where you start with a minimal boot environment, say from a CD or a USB flash disk, um, or you can boot straight disk disk over the usual PXE means from a, from a purely network environment. And that's how an installation works. Right? These are all 
interactive one. So it's the one where you would type through and then watch the screen. But all of this you can also do in an unintended way. Oh, what have I got there? Yes. So all the questions you're asking, uh, you're being asked and you answer, you can answer up front, put those into a configuration file. Um, I'll, I'll do my best to not repeat the information you can already find in the manual pages. So whenever you see the, the dash, it says right here, auto install uh, section eight. Um, I'll briefly refer you to this instead of repeating all the, the information. But just as all the questions you have, you can just write them up front into a plain text file, answer them, and then they will be picked up by the installer and that's it. You can also, if you think there's something else missing in the installer or you need some custom changes, be it configuration files or additional sets, or complete list of programs, whatever, additional files, you can, you can also provide an additional set and custom shell scripting and, and there the endless possibilities start. You can do that if you look at install site, it's a relatively new manual page that explains how to do that. And if you want to upgrade, you can also do the unintended. And in fact, this is what most of you, if you run OpenBC, already have been using, probably without knowing. And because the, the, the interesting call, uh, the, the cool tool here is sysupgrade. And what sysupgrade really is, simply it's a, it's, it's a wrapper around the existing installer and all it really does is it prefetches the sets that have you have them on disk and then it creates a, a small file called auto upgrade and that will be up on reboot it will be picked up by the installer and all the magic isn't really in sys upgrade all the magic is already there has been there for years in the installer in the upgrade logic so anyway i wanted to highlight that sys upgrade is a, is a quite nice way of reusing the existing code instead of you know, duplicating all that logic in, in, in the user space. So of course, there's much more. It also handles firmware upgrade in a very special way. But as we hopefully learn in dur during that talk, most of these processes and mechanisms are very tightly integrated. So when I say install, it's really not just the script that's running at the heart, but it, it begins at logic and, and tweaks in bootloader and with the source upgrade, it can start in the previous boot at, at during during uh, multi-user. So it's a very delicate process with many components working quite well together. But of course, you can also have, or you can use this this environment you have in the installer just as a rescue shell. If you if you mess up your system, or in the unlikely case that an upgrade went wrong, you can take the very same boot media or Ramdisk kernel, you can boot that, drop into a shell, and then you have the most essential tools at your hand and, and hopefully fix everything. So far, it's been, I, I can't recall a case where I had to, to, to pull in anything from an existing installation. Usually, I had everything I needed, an editor and the, the disco path stuff. All of this is in the, in the Ramdisk or in, in the rescue shell environment available. I go, but um, I just pick one example, which is not covered by the manual pages. Mm. But again, if you um, if you look at these, what was it? Sorry, if you look at install side and then auto install, um, there you can find uh, existing examples for common use cases. One I have at the moment, for example, on on my notebook, is a file called upgrade side. You'll find this in the manual. Uh, in the manual, it's a, it's a script that will be called at the end of the installation or effectively uh, the, at the upgrade procedure. And it's a script, a shell script really, just that runs in the change rooted environment of the new installation. So, for example, if you need to fix up something right after the installer basically finished, or the upgrader basically finished, what I do here is I'm, I'm making a backup copy of the EFI bootloader because on this machine I have another operating system installed and whenever this operating system doesn't upgrade, I don't want it to wipe out my, my default bootloader and even if it does that, 
I always have a backup copy so in the firmware menu of the notebook I can just you know select the entry or <laughs> at the last resort in the EFI shell I can I can always boot into my manually copied over bootloader and then I have OpenBSD at my disposal. It's a bit of a hack, of course. Not many people are happy with uh, seeing OpenBSD installed besides some other thing, some other thing on, on the notebook, but you know, that's, that's the world we live in. And to get started about the, the, the details, the, the actual the inner workings of the, comp uh, the installer, I thought of starting with the less obvious components that are flexible, that are not the same on every architecture or on every installation medium. And as previous previously explained, when I say installer, this is really it's the combination of what starts with the bootstrap. Right? So, the, the, so the, the very first code that runs on your machine, that's highly machine dependent. That's the boot blocks and then the bootloader. These you'll can find if you want to look at the code. You can find that in the sysart subdirectories. Um, these already have a bunch of um, variations. Some of them are size constrained. Some of them are just inherently architecture specific. Not all of them have the same fe the, the same features, the same abilities, or just the same hardware really. So, and then of course, depending on whether depending on whether you boot from a floppy disk or CD um, ISO or the mini root image, which can flash on an arbitrary disk, or whether you boot over a network with a PXC install, all of this is uh, built together with different components. And then you have, in principle, architecture independent features, or kernel features really, that then again, are only installed, uh, enabled, sorry, enabled on the platforms that really support them all the way through. For example, soft rate. If you want to have crypt disk or if you want to have software rate 5, whatever, then you can do that on all of the architectures we support, but not all of them support booting of, of these soft rate disks, right? Or not all of them have support for seeing those disks as early as the bootloader. So that's another aspect. For example, if, for example, you have an encrypted uh, installation on your notebook that works because you have an AVD machine, but it would not work if you have, a, say, ARM um, um, v7 machine. And, and so that's the part that's not there on every system. And then after the bootstrap, um, the second part is the RAM disk kernel. Um, again, you have different kernel configurations for the different architectures, and you have on you have, you have different different network drivers, just mostly, these are mostly depending on the needs of the developers. So um, say on, on, RMV, on RMV7, not much work is happening uh, compared to AMD64, Spark64. So if you need some fancy network driver for some, um, some network card or um, pseudo network drivers like Trunk, you'll find these on, on the bigger architectures, but probably not, or maybe not on the, on the smaller ones, just because no one added them all because you have size constraints that would um, not allow you, or not, not very easily at least, to add new kernel code. And then NFS, um, just another thing that's this variable. Last but not least, to, and this is, this is more, this is the thing you actually, the thing you see as a user is the, the user space. And it's really, it's the same code, it's the same set of programs you have in, in regular OpenBSD installation, except it's a minimal subset, and it is even compiled with a um, smaller subset of features. So for example, if you look at the corn shell, you have uh, all the fancy features in the corn shell, but if you have, uh, but the build for the corn shell in the installer, for example, has no um, internal features to handle your mbox file. You just don't need that in the installer. It's blowed, it's ripped out, and it keeps the process smaller and simpler. But it's it can also be hard at some at some time because if you look at the code and you see all these if deaths with a small small kernel, it becomes a bit of a mess. And it's probably something we could 
improve upon. And last but not least, you have just some programs that you, you don't have um, in, in every installation media. Um, for example, not all of them have network. Not all of them have an FTP or FTP command that has TLS support. So not all of them will allow you to use HTTPS. These are just a few of the knobs that are, are variable that that not as it's not as obvious as uh, manual cache. I use um, see it while we're install, and then you wonder why HTTPS is not available. And to come over to the to the way it actually works, um, it it it's not really a special process. You can really think of the installer as a very minimal, very stripped down, regular installation. Right? You have you have a bootloader, you have a kernel. And then you have the classic approach of an init process, and then it would fork over the, the RC script, and then it would drop into a shell. And in, in multi user with X11 or whatever, there's lots of stuff happening. But in the installer, it's quite simple. This RC is just an empty shell script. I think there's just a single double column driven, uh, <laughs> double, double column inside, so that um, I think that the init process actually forks it off, but then it's an empty shell script. It just exits immediately. It's, um, that's that's how it works on on the technical side, but it's it's probably not, not as interesting for you as a bit, uh, as, as a mere user. But knowing this, you hopefully have a better um, better time understanding how the actual how the actual stuff of the installer works. Like the it works the the stuff you see. For example, in the beginning of the talk, you had this prompt saying, "Welcome to the." VSTIC on Euro 23, uh, 2023 program. This was a bit of a joke on the, the first prompt you see on the installer, right? It's a text prompt, and then how this actually works is just, just in, in huge double quotes, uh, just a shell script, and the mechanisms to start all this and you know, to, to have the, the, the decision logic is the same as you would start an interactive shell on your notebook. It's already within the current shell. It, it loads a, a profile file, and in there you have just a little bit of glue code. And that it will handle the, the prompt for or the question for you whether you want to install, upgrade, and it will do a bit of a setup in in the back. It will make sure that if you do an un unattended installation, you can always opt out and you know, as a last resort, go to an, an interactive uh, shell prompt, that's, that's why the timeout is there. And then afterwards, it really executes to the, the installation script proper. And this is where this is where all the logic lies. It's just short of 4,000 4, lines of code. That's including, sorry, in, in, including the comments and empty lines. Uh, if you open this up for the first time, it can be a bit daunting. Look at this this huge of a shell script, but it's surprisingly well structured. It's surprisingly well organized. The style is mostly completely identical. Right? There, here and there, a little bit of variations, just because of evolution over time, and then a new feature was was added or a new style was embraced, but another piece was forgotten. But usually, it's um, once once you come over this initial <laughs> shock of seeing of seeing a four thousand shell. 4,000 4, line shell script, you can get going quite well, I, I, I dare say. And, and this is where all the logic happens. These, this is where the questions are composed. This is where the, the helper functions have. So we don't have to do all this uh, questioning and, and, and uh, sorting, whatever what do we need inside. None of this is like duplicated. And to come back to SUS upgrade, this is also where you have features like if you do an unintended installation with a sys upgrade, and for some reason, most of the time, it's a, it's a filled up disk. Like something goes wrong in the installer, and it doesn't reach its finish point where it says, welcome, oh, congr congrats, you did, a, you did an upgrade, and now a reboot. So in case you never make it there, that's a so-called watchdog, and that resets itself on every new, for example, set installation it does, right? So every time uh, it goes, back into the loop and says, I'm gonna install the new set. It will reset the timer and then count down for like 30 minutes and if nothing happened or if the timer isn't reset in, in, 
inside the 30 seconds, it will automatically reboot the machine. It's not always the best approach, but it's still far better for you to eventually drop back at a bootloader or buy on screen a bootloader prompt or whatever, instead of being stuck somewhere inside this maze of the shell script. So that's where the, that's where the system shot also lies. And then, uh, what's um, and all this, all of this logic is so, uh, try to briefly explain in the install. So all of this is machine independent code, right? So this is the common code that is working across all the architectures we support. Um, um, AMD64, APA6, and ARMv7, ARMv64, uh, um, Spark64. That's a lot, that's a, that's a huge list of architectures. And all this code you see there is executed by all of them. So none of this is duplicated. There's, and that also means that there's a huge work, um, or a huge amount of work gone into the split of the generic code and then the machine dependent code and all the logic in there to, to cleanly separate it in it and make the questions that are common to all of them actually common and, and make them reusable. So in the end, we have an installer that really mostly works the same on all the architectures and all the boot environments we have without really you know, duplicating the work. I think that's a, it's easy to underestimate the, the effort that, we that went into this. Right, so an install in D, that would be, that would be a file where you don't have machine specific code, for example, the, the disk setup. Not every machine has an MBR, not every machine has the GPT support. Uh, some machines like Spark 64 use neither of them. They just have plain disk labels on the disk. So that's where this stuff would go. With so I if anything is unclear in, in the process, I'm, I'm, I'm doing a talk like this for the first time. If anything is unclear, please raise your hand and uh, I don't want to lose you in the, in the meantime. But uh, if you have just a general question, I would defer those to the end. Uh, so please uh, don't make me lose you. Um, next up, I wanted to highlight the bit of the, the build process. Yes? Yes? too stupid to navigate in my own slides, sorry. All right, these. Uh, you mean inside the source directory? Yeah, the one that I was talking about. Uh, you, you would, s yeah, sorry, you, you, f you would find this on the user source distrib, short for distribution. This is this is where these shell, sh shell scripts are. I think I mentioned them on, a, on, a, on, a, on one of the later slides, but yes, usually if you want anything related to the installer, you go to the distrib subdirectory and then now you will see lots of build scripts and architecture specific subdirectories. And this one you would find in the mini root subdirectory of this. This is where these actual files are. The way I denote them here, um, I should have explained this, thank you, is the, the file layout on the actual boot, on, on the system you're booting. Right, so if you, if you drop into the shell and you would do an ls, then you would see an install subscript in the root directory of this, of the germ disk and then the dot .profile, like it would live in your home directory, the dot .profile, or the, the slash root directory. Right, so how it works is, or ha how, how the overall build process, uh, at the example of AMD64, is when you go into user distrib, that would be user distrib art uh, AMD64, and then you have a RAM disk underscore CD mm, subdirectory. The first thing you need to do is uh, what you need is the, there's a the, the bootstrap file. You can you can build this yourself. And this is part of the release process, or um, there's a copy shipped with every installation under user amdac. Um, that's the first thing that's going to be built. And again, I'm trying not to repeat what's in the manual, so I I, I try to reference the, the existing manual pages that will, that will explain in detail how, how these things are put together. But if you want to look at the actual code, you will look at the make files on the user's distrib, 
and uh, you see the different targets using actually make, fa make fast and RD set root. But the gist is you need to combine these components. The first component being the bootstrap. Uh, the second component, and that's what people of often, how people often refer to this is the RAM disk. And the RAM disk is just a, comp just a combination of the actual kernel. That's the stripped down RAM disk configuration of the kernel itself, or just the kernel. And then there's a disk image. So that's a file, it's a prepared file system with all those programs. Uh, and they're glued together with MakerFest and RD set root in the end. So they have a, a single file. That would be that would be the file called bsd.rd if you have on um, your regular installation. That would be the RAM disk, right? Composed of the kernel and the disk image. And inside of that you have all these user space programs I mentioned before. They live in user distrib special um, and they themselves are built into a single binary into a single program it's a, similar to what you know as a uh, buzzy box or busy box under under linux so instead of having all this all these files um, you crunch them together with crunch gen and next after that you have the installer code so that was the install sub and then dot profile and install md these are the actual shell codes they themselves are processed as well so it's a bit of space saving effort so that they run through a small script which uh, strips commons and then uh, unneeded lines inside the script so it, it's not that much it will be safe but it's it'll be worth on some of the architectures that we'll hopefully know about this afterwards uh, in a later slide and we also need on on many platforms is is firmware not all not all of the firmware we can redistribute freely inside of openbc some of them we have Old, older freely available Wi-Fi chip firmware that, that already lives inside the source tree. Um, whatever we have in there, it gets put onto the uh, onto the installation media. But for example, also um, U-boot files for uh, the the, AM, the, ar the ARM boards um, that would count as firmware. Here. And then the <coughs> uh, sorry the the sets. I think I made a slight mistake because the sets are not really contained inside the. So yeah, they are contained inside the disk image of the RAM disk, but if you think bsd.rd, it of course doesn't contain the sets itself. Yeah. That would only hold true for the whole 300 whatever megabytes um, install 7.3 ESO, uh, 7.3 7 image you would, you would download, but that's contained in there as well. And then you have lots of static data, like a master .passwd file. Um, these files also live under user distrib and they're covered over, but also more importantly, have time zone data, so you can actually select during the installation where you live or <laughs> what, what time you should be seeing, and then you have TLS certificates that configure uh, configured as well, so you can fetch over certificates and then uh, sorry, fetch over HTTPS. And then, if you actually want to build this, you know the first uh, recommendation I should do is just release. This is the whole proper release process if you want to build everything over BSD. That will take care of everything. And that's the most simple one, but it's the, it's the slowest one, of course, right? So if you want to only boot the, or if you only want to build the boot media, so you wouldn't want to build the whole whole set of Clang and, the, and all these sets, um, you can do that if you, if you follow these instructions. Um, and, and this is where we're getting into the territory of things that are not really well covered at the moment in existing uh, in this in existing manual pages some of this you just you know figure it out when when you read the the make files or when you ask someone and they patiently reply and explain the process so if you just want to build or tinker around with the boot media and then the installer when you set the change you would follow these instructions make ops you always have to do that and then distrib this is where everything goes and then special this is the subdirectory where all the user space programs are built, you have to build these up front, and then you go into your machine specific directory, in this case AMD64, and I want to build the RAM disk CD, that would in the end give me the CD73.iso, that's just a small ISO without the sets, and the mini root file system, and the BSD RAM disk kernel. You build this, and then afterwards in the OBJ directory, you have all those files, you copy them. Yeah, if you wanted to test them, you can do that now with VM control, 
with VMM on AMD64 that's very handy. That's how I most of the time prototype quick changes. I just fire up the kernel itself, right? You see, there's nothing but the kernel, or sorry, not, nothing but the RAM disk. So if I boot this up, it lands in the installer, but then I couldn't perform a, a full installation. There would only be, there would be no disk, no, in, no interfaces. But this is enough for me to, um, enough most of the time to, to test certain changes or to, to just have a live look inside the system that I just built and see if I made any mistakes. There are, and this is where it gets quite technical because it's not really the best system with regard to introspection, right? There's, um, there's no, no D-trace, obviously, uh, but it, uh, with the shell scripts, y you know how this works. But if you want to look inside, um, there's a little bit you can do, hopefully a small, a small trick here and there with corn shell itself, which should help you regardless of the setup you work in. Um, what I did is you can source the entire subdirect uh, the entire installation script and by sourcing that would mean you just basically load all the definitions the function definitions without executing in any of the code and then afterwards you can say with type set uh, dash f that's a generic control function you can just inspect the function definitions and that often helps me just to find out before dropping into the actual installer find uh, find out what the actual function does or just you know, run them on the spot if that would work, but it's not really. It's a very limited environment, right? Because none of these functions were ever designed to be executed on the spot. But instead, whenever, whenever you reach them inside the install, ins in inside the logic. But non nonetheless, it, um, it's an effective way if you want to see what's going on, or, or if you want to make changes, right? You can. You have an ed editor. That's all you need. You can live hack the installation script. You can just edit it and then add your new function, fix your bug, tweak the bug you just introduced, um, and then drop back out of the interactive shell. You would land back at the install upgrade or auto install prompt with the now edited install script, and then you could test this. It's not the proper way. It's not the proper way to hack at this, but it's way faster than building the installation image seeing that you make a typo mistake in the shell script, drop back out, build everything again, boot it again. So th this is for the prototyping, but of course, you know, um, you should always test a proper installation. So fire up a proper, a proper VM, or even better yet, use real hardware. Not just a VM, because that doesn't, doesn't cover all the use cases, by far not. So if you actually want to hack on this, please, res re please use real hardware and then replicate the real scenarios because it's a very, very delicate system. And I've done this many times myself. I, I thought my change was great. <laughs> I tested it and I worked for my use case and I you might even have committed it and then only to find out a day later that someone else uh, found a flaw in another very, very trivial installation use case. I, I just didn't, in a very, very trivial installation use case, I just didn't, didn't cover myself. So please, Testing is uh, a very important point. Um, to highlight a, a few recent changes in the install, and it's a bit hard to say recent because I think the first one I mentioned here is already a year ago. Um, happens quite fast. We release twice a, twice a year, but nonetheless, it's um, it's interesting to highlight what changed. Sometimes it's the it's the small stuff, right? You, you I'm, I'm installing inside a VM without networking. That's the full installation image attached. I have all the sets. It's a purely offline installation, but it would still ask me to configure networking. I, it, it, the installer itself would see there are no interfaces, but it would still ask me, what, what interface do you want to configure? Do you want to configure VLAN zero? And there would be no physical interface. So it's stupid, right? But at some point, uh, I think Stuart Henderson was it, was it that removed this VLAN check, and then afterwards we just drop the interface configuration altogether when there were no interfaces. It's, n it's an obvious change, but it's the, um, a combination of all those trivial changes that hopefully make the OpenBC install experience the experience you, you know today, right? So these so changes often seem small, but they're quite an important change for the time. And then a recent change by, by Andrew was you the ability to configure your interfaces, not only by an interface name, but by the um, hopefully unique MAC address. 
So that as well is, is documented in the hostname.if file. And it, it's really the same mechanism as you have in user spec. So if you've, you've, if you've already done uh, interface configuration by MAC address, it's just the same. So now instead of at the prompt where you ask which interface to configure, instead of answering EM0, you can just give it the MAC address and then go that, go that way. And then there was a better, I don't remember that, that was sense media default. Yeah, that, that was the, the, the question for the disk that would contain your installation set, right? You would, you would first select your root disk, it says SD0, that's the only disk I have, that's the one I'm gonna install to, so obviously there's nothing on it because I'm gonna format it and, and, and fill this disk with a new installation, and then the new question would, and then the next question, next question would ask you, so where are the sets? Is it on, on the same root disk? And obviously not, it's not on the same root disk. Um, so these are little these are where you can sometimes make it make a small tweak, but it will it will have an have a good chain a good um, a good outcome. Like instead of having to enter an explicit uh, disk name, you could just type yet another enter with the same default. And same for a uh, people got lazy and didn't want to type autoconf for the interface uh, or for the IP configuration. So now I can just type a. And another, and that's a change, it's a list of changes that we've been working on uh, for the last few years by now. Um, it's, it's a bit of an extreme example, but it's a very good example to illustrate the intricate details and, and pitfalls in the installer. So I've added this new question to allow you to encrypt the root disk. Uh, before this, you would follow the FAQ and you had to drop into the shell and do all these steps by hand and hopefully make no mistake. And nowadays we have a proper question for this. So you can just say yes, no, and then possibly be prompted for a passphrase and then it will do all of this. But what might seem like a, a, s a single line of addition to the installer that now defaults to no is really the result of a huge list of changes that came into the tree over the years ago, right? So we've been supporting, well, we've been officially supporting encrypted disk installation on AMD64 and other platforms for years. But if you, if you go to the install and add the new question and then you want to have support on not just AMD64, you start to realize that there are many, many corner cases no one ever ran into or, or never, no, no one thought about and what it means to add a new question is not just to have support for a single architecture for a single use case, but really to make sure that this is covered in the same expectation of, you know, it just works on all the different scenarios. So that was just a good example. And uh, it's also a good example of how the installer is not just the cell script uh, I've explained earlier, but it's really the, the combination of tools that start as early on as the bootloader and the boot blocks, the very first code that runs before the kernel. And then auxiliary programs like install boot, which take the existing bootstraps off a disk and install it well, into, the, into the first few megabytes of the disk and take, all the c take, c c oh, sorry. <coughs> take care of all these little machine specific details uh, that are hidden away behind a single command, right? So um, commands that used to work just fine on, on your favorite notebook that, but that would just crash or do slightly different things on another machine just because you know, no, one, no one thought about uh, cases like the disk encryption on another case. So that's a, that's a good example that when I say install, uh, it's, it's, there's way more to it than that meets the eye. And I've learned that myself quite a few times by breaking, breaking the install and having to back it out or <laughs> adding another fix on top of it. And it's, it's a long process. It's a very fine process, a very, very interesting and entertaining process. But um, yeah, lessons learned. I, I think I've dabbled into the lessons learned already. It's uh, more, complicated, more complicated than it looks. But nonetheless, it, I, I hope that it doesn't discourage you from, from looking at the code or maybe making your favorite change or, or bug fix to it, um, or just learning about the project, like learning how it works and being curious. Thank you. And it's more than it seems. Right, so 
all of this, uh, most of this fits onto a small i386 floppy disk. It's a few megabytes and then it presents you with an installation setup that will do an installation, do an upgrade, do an unintended, do an interactive upgrade over network. Um, all of this works quite well and it's sometimes surprising what we manage to do with that, with that little space. Um, speaking of the floppy, every now and then the kernel code grows or anything grows really and then these very, very size constraints setups start to break. And you can argue that no one really cares about i386 floppy these days anymore but it's a really good measurement for you to keep noticing where the code grows, right? If you just hack on AB64 and then you hack away and you don't have any size, size constraints, but then someone yells at you because the, the build broke on, on I386, you start to realize something, something has been creeping into the kernel over the development cycle um, this year and, and it's time, to it's time for spring cleaning again and then you realize, oh, maybe this 20-year-old driver for hardware that no one, no one really has anymore, maybe it's time to clean this uh, or bring this, bring this, bring this around the corner. So, even though they're not really that relevant anymore, they're still a good measure and very, very useful to the project. It's a thing I had to learn over the years that uh, was absolutely not obvious. Yes, and then the new question I added um, also told me that good phrasing is really hard. So, if you want to ask a question. There are so many ways to ask that question and think that you, are, that you asked it in the right way. But the first, the first version I added that was, it was, you know, it was at the wrong place in the installer. It, was, it had the wrong wording. I, I, thought the, I thought users would understand the technical wording, but it was just too complicated and just needed feedback and iteration. And it also showed me that if you mess with the people's muscle memory, it's... <laughs> It, it will be noticed, right? So even if you if you used over the years to just hit enter, 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 SD0, enter, 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 to, to have a default installation, and then some young fella comes around and adds a new question that will make you enter, enter, SD0, and suddenly enter the wrong question with SD0, this will go, this will not go unnoticed. And it, but it, it goes to show how how used people are to this interface, right? And, and how important this is. And if you mess with it you get into problems. Um, but it's easy to work on. It's, it's, it's just a normal part of improvement and, and development. So, yeah, mentioning this, uh, the, the defaults are hopefully quite great already, but they're never perfect. And uh, as with the initial question where I asked you whether you misanswered the, the setup user question, maybe someday we can, we can fix that, so you will always hit the right answer. Um, but also some of the questions you can back out of. Some of them, if you enter once into this you know, logical branch, you have no other way but Control C and then or exit the installation and you restart it. It's not that much of a problem because most of, most of the questions are, are being remembered and you can just hit enter instead of refilling the same information. But but still, it's a, mm, it's a it's an interesting aspect I would like to to follow over the year, um, to follow up on and make this even more resilient and uh, make it as boring as possible. But boring turned out to be really hard. And if, if you're into encrypted, encrypted key disk, uh, sorry, in encrypted installations, at the moment we only support passphrases, but there's also a way to do this with key disks. If, uh, if, if you want this feature or if you think it's interesting, there's a diff on tech already. Um, that should be maybe hopefully good to go, and then that's really hard way done, and sort of a future plan or, or interest I have is, you know, a bit of more multi-boot awareness, because if you, these days, you end up with multiple OSs on, on your machine, and OpenBSD still has the expectation that if you install it on the machine, it really owns the machine, and it, it's true, but only up to a point. And then at some point, you have to, with this um, upgrade side example I provided, you sometimes have to work around it. You make this work better together. Linux has, has, has more of these awareness bits, and I think OpenBSD is um, at the point where it should catch up with this. Well, that's that's all I have so far. I'm, uh, I hope you could follow me. Uh, call it, you could follow me up to the end. If you have any questions, this is the time. If not, you are 
welcome to, to shoot me a question via email from the first slide. I'm, I'm happy to help people get started on this code because I know it's not always that easy, but um, I would welcome people um, being interested in, in actually hacking on this. So that's it. Thank you very much. Yeah, sure. Uh, what is the limit of the user uh, the user interaction? Uh, how difficult it would be to well support? I have, maybe I have a different question. Maybe you have a different answer. Maybe it's more simple than the question I asked. Uh, I have a use case for the way I think it should be done. Mm -hmm. uh, so let's say you say it's an A user. Yes. Uh, And well, the answer is no, you never get the same installation. And it's very unlikely that, we, that you will get the same installation from the in same installation media because there are processes in the or procedures in the installer such as a relinked kernel. So whenever you install an OpenBSD system, what it does as a security measure is it takes the kernel and actually relinks it. So with every installation you have at OpenBSD, you get to have a unique kernel which is a feature, but it's in direct contrast to what you want, a reproducible installation. So, sorry for that. I don't think this is on the roadmap. <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah. Uh, ought to mention that in, even in the file system itself, you have like, random bits uh, left and right. So it's, um, it's not the direction that the project is heading, reproducibility, n at least not in, uh, in this depth. Thank you. Anything else? If not, that's it. Have a good time. Thank you.